WMPG thrives with support from listeners and from Maine Solar Solutions. Maine Solar Solutions, helping empower homeowners and businesses with solar electric solutions for 10 years. Information at mainesolarsolutions.com. You're listening to WMPG 90.9 Gorham Portland, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Live from the Orion Cygnus arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang, and joining me, as always, is Bernie Warren, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, I'm Sarah. Very good. Thank you. Bernie's our professor of the Astronomy Lab here at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak, and you can head over to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Yes, yeah, certainly. So this will be Friday, July 29th. It'll be a waxing crescent moon just one day past noon, so you might not be able to see it till the next night, but you can look for it. Uh, the days are getting shorter, sunrise is getting later, so it's 526, so pretty early. And then it sets at 808 already, so we're down to 14 hours and 42 minutes. Uh, basically, you still have four of the planets lined up in the sky. Uh, Mercury actually has turned into an evening planet, and Saturn's coming up pretty early now. It's up by 9 o'clock. It'll actually be at opposition August 14th when it comes up right at sunset. So that's certainly broken up, but it's nice to be able to see Saturn in the evening sky before midnight. And then uh, the Delta Aquarium meteor shower peaks uh, tomorrow night, actually, on the 30th, but you can already see some of them. Um, it's not that good in this hemisphere. It's called the Southern Delta Aquarium. Further south, you could probably see like 50 or 60. Here, we might be lucky to see 10 or 15 meteors per hour. So they come out, out of Aquarius, which is kind of low in the sky um, in the evening. So that's coming up for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Bernie. You're welcome. And if you couldn't take notes fast enough, you can also check out the monthly What's Up in the Night Sky in the, the What's Up column, sorry, in the Portland Press Herald. Welcome to another episode of Scientifically Speaking. Bernie, mm -hmm. you and I are joined today by somebody who was a former guest and is back in yes, full force. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our show today we'll be talking about kind of some natural formations and exploring those natural formations. So Bernie, mm -hmm. would you please do the honors of introducing our guest du jour? Yes, certainly. So he is Peter Gillette. Uh, he comes to our astronomy meetings through Zoom and uh, we see him live at least once a year when we have our annual star fest in September in Kenny Bunk by the observatory. So we get to see him then. And he always brings something interesting like a drone or some new camera setup. He was on before talking about astrophotography, and this time he's going to talk about some of his caving and spelunking adventures. So welcome back, Peter. Thank you very much, Bernie and Sarah. Good to see both of you. Yes. Hooray. Yeah, no, we loved you last time, and so we're excited to have you back again. Great. So, <laughs> so as a multifaceted human, um, we talked last time about your many, many hobbies, and one of your hobbies mm -hmm. is caving and exploring the wonders of natural voids in the ground. And so this is really fascinating. We've never talked about this before. We've had some kind of geology talk, um, some show, I think we had a show on Maine coastal geology um, before, but mm -hmm. otherwise it's not like a super, super common topic that, um, that we have. So we're super excited. Um, but before we start, I have a couple questions to kick this off. Great. Um, is there a difference between spelunking and caving? So just so that we can kind of set set the ground here. Sadly, there is a difference between oh, caving really? and spelunking. <laughs> yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, at least these days, um, there's a profound difference between a caver mm -hmm. and a spelunker. Mm -hmm. a a spelunker is someone who goes into a cave, typically with maybe a lighter for a light, a, oh. can, of, a can of Budweiser in the back pocket for a <laughs> oh, beverage, and, uh, and, and 
maybe is wearing at most a baseball cap and sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, right. just a baseball cap well, and sneakers. Okay, maybe <laughs> maybe shorts and a t-shirt too. <laughs> let's let's uh yeah. <laughs> at any rate, it's it's someone who is is very ill prepared to be in in <laughs> such a space and really has no business being there. Oftentimes <laughs> they end up uh, being the ones that uh, uh, that mark up a cave or break oh. formations. Uh, oh, painting. I, I was going to say, I hear a little disdain in your voice. I'm, I'm afraid there is, yes. <laughs> to, to call someone who takes it seriously a spelunker is uh, a bit of a cut. Mm. So we are cavers. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I will so, say though, when I search for spelunking mm -hmm. in Google, it literally yeah. says the exploration of caves, especially yeah. as a hobby. Yeah, and we yeah. can uh, we can bring that up with Oxford, uh, maybe the Oxford Dictionary, <laughs> maybe we should, or Wiki or somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might not be a bad thing. <laughs> and so, a caver then is, in your opinion, ideally someone who. Well, who, who approaches the, the, we'll say hobby, the occupation of, of caving uh, seriously and, and with uh, proper preparation, which should include uh, a, a serious helmet, like a rock, uh, mm. a, a mountain climbing helmet, something that can protect your head from serious impact because there's rocks everywhere above you when you're caving <laughs> and... Uh, They'll, they'll leave a mark. Mm -hmm. Also, three independent sources of light. And I mm. don't mean lighters. I mean <laughs> headlamps, ideally things that you're not stuck to uh, carry in your hands. You need your hands to keep you stable. Because oftentimes the uh, area underground is very uneven and slippery and even wet. And... Uh, uh, you need your hands just to help keep your balance, keep you from slipping and falling. So three sources of light means that you have one primary source that you depend on as, as your means of getting around. It should be uh, hardy enough to put up with a wet, cold environment. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, other two sources of light should be the same or similar, such that uh, if your primary source goes out, You've still got a backup that will safely get you out of there. And if something happens on your way out, you still have another light. <laughs> Make darn sure you get out. I feel like a mag light would like to endorse you at this point. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I, I, mag lights were pretty old, oh. are pretty old school at this point. <laughs> outside of, of course, they actually have uh come a long ways they have switched over to leds but mm. back when i started caving um halogen lights were uh, uh were just barely coming in and i wow. was i was actually uh altering uh flashlight bulbs to put in halogen lights wow. in the bulb sockets <laughs> in order to have a brighter light for caving than just the straight tungsten incandescence that uh that i started with I, I did not start with the uh, the carbide lamps <clears throat> that uh, some people did, <laughs> but uh, carbide lamps always made me nervous around ropes. Mm. If I'm hanging from a rope and I have a flame projecting out of my forehead, it just seems like a bad combination. <laughs> Cut the rope and you're gone. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. you don't want a warm rope. <laughs> warm not rope. that warm. <laughs> So three independent sources of light, protection for your head, mm -hmm. gloves are, are a really good idea, knee pads are a really good idea, boots that are going to handle a rock falling on them mm. and hopefully not crush a toe yeah. or, or worse. Um, uh, those are all important parts of it. Knowing the cave you're going into is, is uh, a really good idea or going with other people that know the mm. cave you're going into. Um, making sure that somebody on the outside knows where you're going and knows when to worry. Oh. That is to say, 
if you're not back out and in contact by such and such a time, it's time to take some action. So those are all important things for anyone that's thinking about getting into caving and doesn't want to be called a spelunker. Excellent safety <laughs> I'm tips. Prepared. Do you usually have to go with do you usually go with another person too, even if you know the cave or for safety? It's it's more than one. I have uh, <clears throat> had pretty well drilled into me and experientially uh, reinforced that uh, really the minimum size caving party should virtually always be four. Mm -hmm. And there's a very good reason for it. Well thought out. And, and I've, I've run across this going south when trying to cut corners. Mm -hmm. Four people ends up meaning that if one person gets injured in a cave and cannot self-rescue, you have a person that can stay with the victim mm -hmm. and have a buddy system of two that can exit the cave in order to, in order to make sure that there, there will be help on the way. Mm. Um, I ran across a situation one time in a very simple cave, an introductory cave that, uh, um, I wanted to, well, a couple of people approached me, wanted to experience Vermont caving. And, uh, um, I took them to this cave that was a very typical Vermont cave. It's, uh, um, a really novel little cave. It's only about, I don't know, maybe 80 feet long or so. And it goes through, it cuts through a hill mm. and it, it, uh, has a very classic looking cave type entrance, rather small, but not terrible. Yeah. But it uh, starts off as a room that then um, pinches down to a little hole, you know, about about like that. <laughs> and and you have to uh, uh, orient your body relative to the hole in order to make it through. And and as soon as you get your head and your shoulders into this space, you see that uh, oh well, this opens right back up. It bells out into a whole nother room. And this does this cave does this two or three times uh, during the course of the cave, and one person, uh, both of these people decided that they were starting to get a little nervous about it, mm -hmm. and I said, "Don't worry, I can walk you and talk you through this whole thing. It's really not as bad as it looks." I got one of them talked through it. The one that uh, um, that thought he was going to have the most trouble with it, I said, "I'll walk you through it first. So I slipped through this hole and then started talking this next person uh, through and got him through. But mean, but he had some trouble figuring out how to orient his body and pull and push and this and that. So this other person was still sitting back in this first room, hearing all this difficulty going mm -hmm. on. And even though the, the third person was um, much thinner, and and lankier easy easier to get through the spot um he got quite nervous about it and decided and no he's he's not going to do that and so i found myself in the predicament of okay i've got one person in this room with me i've got another person on the other side of this hole who would have to work his way back from there on his own or I leave this one person deeper in the cave and go back through this hole to assist this other person back out. Mm. And I suddenly went, aha, that's why you do four people. Yeah. So that you make sure you've got a buddy system mm. on both sides of a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. It's, uh, it, it, it works. <laughs> Excellent safety tip. It sounds like you're a tour guide. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, other times, other times I'm just a uh, willing or perhaps unwilling <laughs> tourist along for the ride. I've, I've been on both sides of that coin. How long have you um, been caving? You know, I was trying to figure that out earlier today <laughs> and, and the number that that came up for me was, well, I was initially introduced to it back in about, I'm going to guess, 1965, 
five or wow. so. Oh. And oh. and that was all big tourist cave type mm-hmm. stuff, but it was way cool. Mm. Didn't get didn't get to really uh, continue that at the time, and really started back up about thirty five years ago. Mm. Mm-hmm. So when I was seven. <laughs> seven. Oh, that's good. You started 55, but you were just seven. <laughs> you, know, you can be like Bernie, who, you know, with his astronomer like self, he'll say something like, oh, yeah, I just started getting into this. And it was like 20 years ago. Yeah. How time Very flies big. when you're having fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, what, what is it about caving that um, excites you or that really keeps you going? Is it, uh, is it what you find in there? Is it the, the process of getting through it? There are so many different aspects of it um, that, that I find appealing and scary and <laughs> <laughs> challenging all at the same time. Uh, I don't know. There have been there are caves that I have been in, and and even though they've been relatively small, some people would say tight caves. I have just felt so comfortably, um, um, like hugged mm. in there that it's just been wonderful. I've been in other places that have been similar, where I've just said, "Can't do it. I'm out." <laughs> I'm going that way. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, there are there are just there are all, all sorts of different ways things can go. And and as far as the appeal, um, I think mostly it's the personal challenge. Mm, of, I was going to say, is it yeah. the the challenge of like getting through? It's it's the, the challenge of yeah. of getting through, mm. um, doing it, doing it with style and grace and and uh um who knows what i'll what i'll find you know it's exploration <laughs> it's exploration in a whole different direction even though yeah. um some people have said it's so weird that you spend time looking up at the stars mm. and other times you go down into the ground it just mm-hmm. what is it and i say well i guess i like to be in the dark <laughs> <laughs> But you use different types of flashlights in both situations. That's for sure. (laughs) Um, So you described kind of you like being hugged. (laughs) Well, you know, there are just there are just well, I'm I'm a hugger. (laughs) (laughs) But you like being hugged by rocks or or you know some places it just it just feels that comfortable. Yeah, just it's just it's it's peaceful. It's quiet, but it's not quiet quiet there's Mm -hmm. water dripping and echoing and it's i don't know it's just really oh the well another aspect of it is the focus Mm. i'm mean to tell you Mm. you there are there are times and places where where your focus when caving comes down to just a a half inch rope in front of your face and you pay attention to nothing but that and the gear yeah. that you're using mm. to go up or down that rope because that's all there better be <laughs> <laughs> nothing else is gonna matter um when you describe kind of these really tight areas um you know sometimes i get sometimes like, like you're trying on a piece of clothing and it's like too tight and then you struggle <laughs> getting it off sure. like yeah. i'm scared <laughs> I can't get it off. You better not go into the cave. <laughs> no, but you know, it, it reminds me of, um, so I grew up in Georgia and our, uh, our like field trip place that we would go to, sure. like one of the places we went on field trips to was um, in Tennessee, Ruby Falls. Okay. And um, heard of it at all? Not, not heard of it? Uh, no, but the tag, the tag area, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, yeah. is a huge caving area so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so ruby falls is kind of near chattanooga and um we're like two hours north of atlanta or so and w- ruby falls is essentially a little big waterfall 
I don't think it's actually red. I don't remember why they call it Ruby Falls, but yeah. um, the way you so they take you, you know, down into a cave and and it's a waterfall oh. within a cave. Oh, okay, and, yeah. And I do recall as a kid when I went through it, they would show like these little. They're kind of like, you know, mole tunnels, if you will. And um, they would point out, oh, this is where humans, like when they were exploring this, trying to get through to the falls. I don't know how they knew there were waterfalls. Um, and they would like crawl through it. And like, I mean, those were, it was like not just a small, you know, section of, oh, I just got to get through this and then I'll right. be out, you know. It was hundreds of feet of like 10 inch like wide space or whatever, oh, yeah. like maybe even less. I was yeah. like, I don't think I could have even like as a little kid. I don't think I could have even fit in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm familiar with spaces like that, and and spaces that at least look like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've been in I've been in some places where, um, um, I've I've fought my way into a room. Uh, with much effort, gotten in there and been so winded that uh. I've turned around and looked back at the hole I just came out of and gone, no way. No way can I fit through that. And it's the only <laughs> way out. And fortunately, I, I try to cave with people that I know and trust and mm. completely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and fortunately, a couple of them were in there ahead of me after I dug the place out, dug yeah. the, the tunnel out, and they made it through and said, you got to come try this again. Come on. <laughs> and I went, oh, no. <laughs> and, and said, okay, here I come. And I made it through, but it was tough. And, uh, and when I, like I said, when I looked at the, at the opening, it was like, Oh my God, that's, it's, it's this big. I yeah. can never fit back through that. How am I going to do this? And, and fortunately they saw that I was just kind of losing it. <laughs> and they, they said, hush, go up and sit in the corner there, chill for a bit and you'll be fine. We will make absolutely <laughs> sure that, uh, that you can get out. And I did. And, uh, after, 15 minutes or so of, of just refocusing, recentering, packing my brain back into my body. Um, <laughs> I, I went back through that, through that hole. And, and when I came out into the, uh, the previous room, I was absolutely giddy with <laughs> laughter at how easy it was to get back through it. And how amazing mm. it looked like such a tiny, tiny hole. So <laughs> you'd be surprised, Sarah. Mm. There are there are places that look like I could never fit through that. But <laughs> and it's it's almost like mountain climbing where mm. you where you get to a spot where you've got to step across a chasm that's unnervingly deep. Yeah. But but actually the the span you have to broach is is a foot mm -hmm. and your mind just says it's impossible i cannot yeah. get across this and it's really just a foot and if it was you know out on the sidewalk you'd think nothing of it yeah yeah it's the fear <laughs> of what could happen <laughs> oh yeah oh for sure for um sure so i'm assuming that when you are like going caving these are roots or trails what i don't know what you call them that have already been like gone through like you're not discovering new caves or are that, you that depends <laughs> there are still many 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 caves yet to be discovered mm. um here in vermont right now um, um there's a group in our in our club the vermont cavers association uh that is um using lidar mm to find places that look potential and and then going out with gps and finding these spots and inspecting and finding amazing 
amazing new caves. Wow. So there are new caves out there. I've uh, um, actually discovered a, a few caves myself here wow. in Vermont. And it is an extraordinary experience knowing that nobody's been in here before. And, yeah. and uh, this is pretty special. It's cool, so, too, because yeah. it's like you're breathing air that nobody else is. Breathing. Absolutely. Although, mm -hmm. in all fairness, uh, um, there are usually, at least here in Vermont, porcupines. <laughs> and, and occasionally raccoons. I was going to ask you about some uh, friends that oh, yeah. you may run into. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And depending on the uh, circumstances, the, uh, the type of cave, um, um, well, I, I know of one I've been in part way and decided, ah, that's far enough. I better not take this all the way down. It was fall, <laughs> and there was a lot of bear scat around the top of the the top oh, of the opening. Mm. And I said, yeah, that's a bear den. I'm not going to go visit that one. Mm. <laughs> mm. But in other caves, uh, there are um, crawfish. You know, mm. if there's oh. if there's water, I find blind crawfish and. Uh, um, um, critters like that in in some of the caves wow. so yeah it's kind of cool no bats oh That's bats. What I think of. <laughs> oh absolutely bats and in fact um um i've been for the past quite a few years now um um helping the uh, vermont uh, agency of national Re natural resources do winter hibernation uh, hibernaculum surveys of bats in a number of uh, um, mines and caves wow. around here. And I must say, uh, we went out this spring. We typically go out in, in late winter when the bats are, are securely asleep and less likely to be disturbed. And um, um, we've fortunately started this process before white nose syndrome uh, hit the area. And so we had some absolutely amazing pre-illness numbers, mm -hmm. some pre-illness data to use as comparison for some of the um, initial hit wow. of, of white nose syndrome. And now looking at the uh, recovery where it's a recovery yeah. and, the, wow. and the decimation where it's not. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's pretty. How many pretty... fewer bats are there now? Well, uh, I don't have, I don't have solid, solid numbers. Um, myself, the numbers go into the agency of natural resources hmm. um, and they keep the, they keep the books, but um, um the there are some species that have have completely disappeared mm. no. yeah, from 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 really all of new england to my knowledge mm -hmm. uh, there are other species that we didn't really know a whole heck of a lot about because mm -hmm. we hadn't had places where they were getting seen often enough to be able to study them well mm. and unfortunately some of well one of the caves that i discovered turned out to be perhaps the largest hibernaculum known in Vermont for this one species of bat. Hmm. And, uh, and it's been pretty decimated. Wow. We did not get in there this year. So I don't know how it, uh, hmm. how it turned out this year. There was too big an ice plug in the, uh, in the opening. So we couldn't get in, hmm. but, uh, but uh, a couple of species are are seeming to recover. The big brown bat is uh, is looking good, and the little brown bat is doing kind of okay. It's mm -hmm. still a little marginal, but it's mm -hmm. hopeful. Yeah. But yeah. some of the others, the the tricolor or pipistrels, are are not doing well at all. Places where we saw hundreds before, we're finding maybe one or two, maybe if we're lucky. Yeah. Wow. 100%. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, if if you're lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Peter, thank you so much for joining and sharing um, some of the introductory details of your experiences caving. 
Um, we would like to love to have you back on to talk more about the caves you explored. And um, just we have so many more questions about caves. So thank you so much, Peter. It's my pleasure, and I look forward to next time. You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and Peter Gillette. Stay tuned for something for the weekend with Anella and from your favorite nerds, keep calm and cave on.